I came across a story that affected me, and I think it will affect you. For me, any story about a father right now would, <laughs> would be tender because uh, just four Saturdays ago, my 91-and-a-half-year-old Sicilian father went to heaven. He's dancing in glory, playing tennis and gardening, showing people his tomatoes and his zucchinis and all of that. He's having a great time in heaven, but this story struck me, and I want to share it with you. The Chicago Bulls won six NBA championships, and one of those championships came just three years after superstar Michael Jordan's father was brutally murdered. James Jordan was sitting in his car asleep at a rest stop in South Carolina, and a gunman shot him at point blank, range, uh, point blank range, and Michael Jordan lost his father. So when the winning shot swished through the net and the final buzzer of that championship game went off, reporters and press people flooded the locker room as they would this tremendous victory, expecting to see an ebullient Michael Jordan, arguably one of the greatest players in the history of the NBA, excited to see him and interview him about this great moment. But what they saw shocked them and surprised them because when they came into the locker room, Michael Jordan was face down on the floor, sobbing and weeping. And they thought, what's going on here? And they, do we talk to him? <laughs> do we try to get an interview? Do we leave him alone? Does he need support? What's going on here? And as they searched their memory banks for why on this great day would Michael Jordan be clutching a basketball, convulsively weeping on the locker room floor, and they realized it was Father's Day. And that the one person that Michael Jordan wanted to see more than anybody. It was not a reporter, and it wasn't a fan. He wanted to see his father, but when he looked around on that great victory day, his father was gone. And that story hit me because it occurs to me that no matter how successful you are, no, no matter how much money you have, no matter how, how many victories you win in your life, you're just a person that needs a father. And it won't matter what you accomplish or what you achieve in your life if you don't have that sense of a father being present to partake in your moment, your life won't mean much. There's something about a father's presence that makes life complete. And like Michael Jordan, we may have everything we've ever wanted, fame and accomplishments and applause and all the rest, but until we know God as our Father, until we know that He is present with us, our lives will not be complete. Even our greatest moments will always be looking for that missing ingredient. And maybe that's why Philip, one of the followers of Jesus Christ, who was such a seeker of truth. He wanted reality. Maybe that's why he said these words to Jesus. He said, Lord, show us the Father. Show us the Father and we will be satisfied. That's a good place for us to start. Right there. A prayer. Lord, show us the Father so that our hearts will be satisfied so that we will find what we need. That's a great prayer as we begin this series called Sons and Daughters because we all need to see the Father. We all have something on the inside of us that isn't satisfied until we see the Father. It's important for us to grasp who God the Father is and why he's important and how he feels about us. Those are things we need to know. We need to know, is Father God proud of us or is he disappointed? We need, we need to know what does a relationship with God the Father look like? 
And most of all, every single one of us needs to know our identity and worth as his sons and daughters. So that's what we're going to be talking about. And I want to start with a question today that may shock you and surprise you. Why did Jesus come into the world? God sent Jesus into the world. Why did he come? Well, people say, well, that's easy. Jesus came to die on a cross for our sins. But I want to shock you by saying that's not exactly accurate. Jesus didn't come to die on the cross for our sins. Jesus came to reveal the Father to us. And a glorious, amazing part of his mission was to die on a cross for the sins of the world so that he could save us. But that was a sub-point in a larger mission which was ultimately to show us the Father to help us to know who the Father is. Now, why would Jesus want us to know who the Father is? Why would that be important to us? Well, for one thing, Jesus was enamored with the Father. He loved the Father, and as you read the Gospels, you will find Jesus constantly talking about the Father, referring to the Father, mentioning the Father. I only do what the Father tells me to do, and the Father has done this for me, and the Father, Jesus was distracted by the Father. He was greatly in love with the Father, but also, why would he want us to know the Father? And it hit me just this morning, because we live with orphan hearts. Something is missing in our lives. We live with orphaned hearts in orphaned cultures on an orphaned planet. And the most important thing that an orphan needs is to meet their father, to know someone's gonna take care of them, someone is gonna love them, someone is gonna provide for them, and someone is present with them. That's the greatest thing. And so when we say Jesus didn't come just to die on a cross, he came to reveal the father, it wasn't like, hey, here's a picture of my dad. Isn't he cool? That's not what it is. He came to bring us into a relationship with God the Father that would so satisfy us and so complete that yawning gap in our lives and it would heal us through and through. Jesus came into the world to show us the Father. So we need the Father in our lives and Jesus came to show us the Father. But how would we see the Father? How would we come to know who Father God is. Let's take a look at that passage of Scripture, the context around which Philip said, Jesus, show us the Father. Let's take a look at that whole moment and see if we can gain some clues there. It's John chapter 14, starting at verse 6 through verse 10. We'll put it up on the screen for you because I want you to see what Jesus said. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to what? The Father. You see, as you read this, I want you, there's a lot in this, but I want you to notice how fascinated, how committed Jesus is to the Father and getting us into the Father. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. If you had really known me, you would know who my Father is. From now on, you do not, you do know him, and have seen him. And that's where Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. And Jesus replied, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show him to you? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Now, there's a lot of ways that we could understand that passage, and it's fairly full of deep truths, and there's a lot of different directions, but what I want us to just focus on really simply is just the one layer of how committed Jesus is to showing us who the Father is. 
He said, and we know it, we quote it, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But the way to what? The truth about what? And where does the life come? It comes from the Father. I came, he's saying, to bring you to the Father, and I represent the Father. Now, he's not saying that he's literally the Father. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, I came to show you exactly what the Father looks like, and everything that I do will paint a picture for you. If you're looking at me, you're seeing the Father. And what he does is he takes two separate identities and he fuses them together. And this is what has to happen for every one of us here today. Because a lot of us think of God, the Father, and then we think of Jesus. God, the Father, uh, I'm not so sure. He's kind of angry. He throws thunderbolts. He's the man upstairs, long gray beard, father time, kind of disconnected, a little grouchy. And then there's Jesus, my man. Jesus is just all right with me. And, and it's like, he loves me, Jesus loves me, but, well, I don't know if I want to meet the Father. That's kind of how, and what Jesus does is he said, guys, we got to bring this together. When you're looking at me, you're looking at the Father. The two identities are not separated. Now, I don't want to get into a big discussion of the Trinity, because the Bible does teach that God is one in three persons. One God in three persons. Father, say it with me, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's a little bit hard to understand, but then, of course, the nature of God would be. How God is built would be hard for us to understand. He's one, one person, one God who exists in three personalities, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus wasn't saying, I am the Father. He was Jesus. What he is saying is, when you're looking at me, you're seeing the Father. Because I represent the Father, and if you want to know what the Father is like, look directly at me. How would we know what Father God is like? How would we, how would we see him? Well, we would go to his website. We would click on the button that says about, right? And we would, we would just look, right? We would Google it, we would see, no. If you want to see what the Father is like, Jesus said, you got to get your eyes in the right place. Amen. You have to, you have to, you can't look at Muhammad if you want to see what the Father is like. You can't look at your philosophy if you want to see what God is like. You can't check your opinion and what your heart really tells you. That's not what's going to reveal the Father to you. If you want to know what the Father is like, if you really want to know God, you have to look at Jesus Christ. Well, I look at nature and I see God. That, I mean, that's great. But nature's only going to take you so far. If you really want to know what God the Father is like, look at the Son. That's why Jesus said to Philip, don't you get it? You're looking at the Father right here. Stop looking everywhere else. If you want to know what God the Father is like, look at the Son because the Son represents the Father. I remember turning, thank you for the chocolate cake. Um, honey, l let go of it. You're, she's literally cl clutching that cake, and it's my birthday cake. I'm just turning 61. I remember about 20, 22 years ago when I was about to turn 40, I remember struggling to read the Bible. In fact, I was struggling to read a lot of things. And I thought, man, there's something something going on. So we had a eye doctor in the church at that time, uh, Dr. Somi O, oh, and I went to see her and she did an examination and she said, you have presbyopia. And uh, I said, no, I'm Pentecostal. I'm not Presbyterian. <laughs> she said, no, that means old eyes. I said, what? I'm just turning 40. She said, you need glasses. I said, I don't need glasses. You mean reading glasses? She said, no, you're messed up. You need, you need like glasses from the morning you, from the time you wake up in the morning until you go to bed at night, if you want to see things clearly. And it's amazing because I lived with a fuzzy perception of the world and I, I kind of, I got used to it, except when I was trying to read and so on. Then I would, then I would start, I didn't know how bad my vision was. 
But then when I put on those glasses, I had a lens that suddenly gave me the accurate picture of the world around me. And when I talk to you about Jesus and his identity and why he came, I wanna say this to you, that Jesus provides us with the lens that enables us to see the Father and what he's actually like. So we all have a fuzzy perception of God. We, we wouldn't know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to guess what God is like except if I look at Jesus. And when I look at Jesus, then I start to understand what the Father is like. And it's so important. Let me give you a few verses here just uh, because you've got it. We've all got this split vision and we need to fuse it together so we really understand. If we're saying, Lord, show us the Father, we gotta know where to look. And I'm telling you, if you wanna know the Father, you gotta look right at Jesus. Look at this. Hebrews chapter one, verse three, says the Son, that's Jesus, the Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Jesus exactly represents Exactly. You can't say, well, I know Jesus would be nice, but I don't think God the Father is nice. He's more, on the, he's more on the grouchy side. No. If you're looking at Jesus, you're seeing the Father. He's the exact representation of the Father. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. For in Christ, now this is a wow. Read this slow because it, it hits me like a, like a cannonball. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. Wow. Everything that God is, all of his power, all of his wisdom, all of his compassion, all of his authority, everything that God is lives inside of Jesus. There is nothing about God that isn't inside of Jesus Christ. So when we look at Jesus, we are absolutely getting the whole picture. Everything that God is dwells in the heart of Jesus and in the life of Jesus, which is so powerful. That means when you see Jesus, you are seeing the Father represented perfectly. And then one more passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. Stay with me now. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. Who was in Christ reconciling the world to himself? God the Father, right? Imagine this, if I put on a glove, there's the glove and there's the hand. What Paul is saying here is, the Father is the hand inside the glove of Christ. So that when you see that hand coming at you as healing, you don't say, here comes Jesus, my healer. You have to say, here comes my father coming to me in the glove of Jesus Christ, touching my life. It's not that God is way out there saying, nah, I don't know, Jesus, you probably shouldn't take it. I don't think he deserves the healing. No, 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 he's cool. Let me heal him. Ah, all right. That's not how it is. When you and I were dirty sinners lost in our sin, it wasn't Jesus who came for you. It was the Father who came for you. God was inside of Christ, no longer holding your sins against you. And you need to understand this. You need to understand that God the Father no longer holds your sins against you. Because the greatest lie that's ever been perpetrated on humanity is God is not for you. Now we sometimes say, well, Jesus, yeah, he's for you. And then, you know, in some religions, talk to his mother. Yes, Jesus is kind of grouchy. But if you go through his mother you're gonna get something, right? We've got all these degrees of separation from God, but we don't need 
mediators in between. There is one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. And he has brought everything that the Father is. And it's not that Jesus forgives you, but the Father is still mad. It's not that Jesus forgives you and cleanses you, but you better watch out because one day you're gonna see God. And you got a whooping coming. No. God was in Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now, the reason I'm giving you a little bit of this theology and truth is because this is gonna equip you to stand and defeat the lie. When the enemy says your God is against you, your God says you don't deserve this, your God says you're not gonna be healed, your God says you're on your own, your God says I'm not providing for you, you know, look what a mess you've made. No, we look right at Jesus and then we know, wait a minute, that's all a lie. Because if I'm looking at Jesus, I'm looking at the Father. Does anybody understand what I'm saying? And so that when you pick up your Bible, and I pray that you will, and you read the New Testament, and you read the Gospels, and I pray that you will, and you, you begin to see who Jesus is and what he does, you're actually learning who the Father is. For, for example, the woman that was taken in adultery in John chapter 8, you guys remember that story? They caught her in the very act, the shameful act of sexual brokenness and immorality and sin and they caught her red-handed and they brought her out to the town square and they surrounded her like a pack of hyenas. Religious people itching to get a rock and just give it to her. Let's stone her. Jesus, come on, pick up a rock. Here we go, man. We're gonna, we're gonna do it the Bible way right here. And Jesus steps forward and he stands between her and the rocks and he says, that's enough right there. Just stop. What was he doing? He was doing what any father would do if his child was accused. He was doing what any father would do to pick up and heal and restore his daughter. When you saw Jesus protecting this woman, you saw what the Father is like. This is why Jesus told this story of the prodigal son that wasted his life and sinned and dishonored his father and ran away from home, but finally came back bedraggled and besoiled, just hoping to be a slave in the Father's house, just to fill his belly, just to, just to somehow survive it all. And Jesus tells the story of how the father, it's the father that runs out after his child. Every encounter in the New Testament, in the Gospels, where you see Jesus healing, that means the father heals. When you see Jesus providing for a multitude, that's because the father provides. When you see Jesus defending the condemned, that's because the father defends the condemned. And once you bring those two things together and you say, Lord, show us the Father, and the Lord says, you're looking at him. You look at me, you're seeing the Father. And it helps us, I think, to live better lives. Here's, here's why this matters so much, because first of all, we're never gonna be strong, are we? unless we know our Father is for us and with us, unless we really, really know the Father and know what he's like, how could we ever stand in a day and age like this? But I tell you, when God, my Father, I know he's for me and I know my sins are removed from me and I know he's gonna provide and I know he's gonna make a way where there is no, that I have a Father, whether I'm winning a championship or falling flat on my face, it doesn't matter because I know my Father is with me. And that brings me a stability and a strength in life. It gives me purpose. It gives me a reason to get up in the morning to know that God is for me. And if God is for me, who can be against me? Come on, somebody. But it also helps me to understand what I'm supposed to be. Because if I'm supposed to be like Christ, 
And I can read the Bible and understand, okay, Christ was a forgiver. Christ was a redeemer. Christ was gracious. Christ was strong. He, there was nothing in Christ that played around with sin. He knew the difference between right and wrong, and so must I. And so must I. But I can look and become my most mature version of myself by following Jesus. Because Jesus is always going to lead me to become like the Father. The Father is patient. The Father is kind. The Father is gracious. I don't know if this is making any sense to you, but keep coming back for the next week, the, the next uh, six weeks or so, because we're going to dive into why this matters so much to every single one of us. You can't have the Holy Spirit as a vapor and Jesus as your best buddy and the Father as your angry uncle and do well in life. That's not gonna, you need to understand who you are. You need to know whose son or daughter you are and you need to know how he feels about you. And that's what we're, that's what we're here to help you discover in this series. Let's take a quick look at one story in the New Testament because I want to practice what it's like to look at Jesus and then see the Father, okay? There's a story in the New Testament, the book of Mark about Bartimaeus. And the reason I like this story about, because Bartimaeus was blind and Jesus touched his eyes. And there's a sense in which all of us, in a way, are blind to really what we need to see. But once we could come to Jesus and he could touch our eyes, maybe that would be the miracle of today. Maybe the miracle of today would be that Jesus would touch our eyes and cause us to see the Father as never before. Let's, let's look at this story and see if we can see what Jesus is all about so we can understand what the Father is all about. It says in verse 46, this is the message translation, it says that they some, spent some time in Jericho as Jesus was leaving town, trailed by his disciples and a parade of people, a blind beggar by the name of Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, was sitting alongside the road. When he heard that Jesus the Nazarene was passing by, he began to cry out, Son of David, Jesus, mercy, have mercy on me. Many tried to hush him up, but he yelled louder. I like this guy, Bartimaeus. Son of David, mercy, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped in his tracks, call him over. Throwing off his coat, he was on his feet at once and came to Jesus. And Jesus said, how dare you ask me for anything? Is that what he said? He said, what can I do for you? And the blind man said, Rabbi, I, I want to see. On your way, said Jesus, your faith has saved and healed you, and in that very instant, he recovered his sight and followed Jesus down the road, and you would too, you would too. In this story, if, if I could say this, a father is giving his child what he desperately needs. He needs to see. And in this story, we see God the Father, the hand inside the glove of Jesus, absolutely loving this man, caring for this man, and opening his eyes so that he could see. It's amazing when you think about the things that can blind us to the Father. We're not blind. There, there may be somebody blind listening to my voice online or here in the auditorium, or maybe legally blind. But all of us are blind in a certain way spiritually, and that might be the worst type of blindness, is where we can't see who God really is. And you can't know him if you can't see him. That's why the Bible says Satan works so hard to blind our eyes. It says the God of this world blinds people's eyes so they can't even see God. But there's something about saying that prayer, Lord, I wanna see the Father. I wanna see the Father. And then the miracle of sight comes. And when that miracle of sight comes, we realize three simple things about who the Father is. First of all, we realize that the Father is near. The Father is near. Jesus was passing by where Bartimaeus was, and Jesus could hear the cry of a person in need. Do you know that God can hear your cry whenever you pray? 
Whatever you're asking for, God can hear you. You say, well, he's so far away. I'm, I'm in such pain. I'm, I feel so alone. How could God possibly hear me? What you don't understand is you've got the wrong idea that God is far away. He's actually close. He's right there next to you. In your sorrow, in your pain, in your loneliness, God is so close. The Bible says that he's a present help in a time of need. That means he's sitting right next to you. You're not alone. You're not a widow. You're not really alone. You're not single, not really. You're not lonesome, not really, if you understand the Father is so close to you. This will complete something in you that nothing else can do. A lot of people question the nearness of God when they're going through hard times, and I understand that. I don't make fun of it. It's natural in hard times to say, God, where are you? But we have to understand who the Father is. He's passing right by us. He's very close. The other thing we see is that the Father is interested. Bartimaeus cries out, and Jesus said, I hear something. Who is that? Oh, you? What is it that you want? I'm interested. And a lot of people think of God as so far away. He's distracted. He's mean. He's uncaring. But Jesus blows that up by how much love he shows for people. And the hand in the glove, the Father's hand inside the glove of Jesus to say, what can I do for you? What is it that you want? Be specific. When the Father invites you to tell him what you need, it's a powerful thing. He's interested. He loves us. He wants to know what we want. He cares. He wants to hear our hearts cry. He wants to hear our voice. He wants to hear our prayers. He's waiting for us to ask. He delights to give things to his children. All you have to do is ask. One time Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit, and he said, my father will give the Holy Spirit to anybody who asks. If you ask your father for a piece of bread, is he going to give you a scorpion? So my father will give you anything you ask for. He'll give you the Holy Spirit. And Romans 8 says, God didn't keep back his own son, but he gave him for us. And if God did this, won't he freely give us everything else? The Bible says no good thing will he withhold from those who do what is right. So we say, Lord, this is it. I need a home. I need a house. I, I need a wife. I need a husband. I need a divorce. No, you wouldn't say that, but... Be careful what you pray for. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> we ask for what we need. And the Father is right there to give it to us. And the last thing that's so important that we see in this story is that the Father is gracious. Yeah, he's good. I mean, God is just good. And again, we've all labored under this fuzzy vision that Jesus is the good one. <laughs> Jesus is the nice one. But oh, we're a little scared of the Father because on the Father's, on Judgment Day, we're going to meet the Father. Oh man, that's going to be awkward. He's really coming for us. Jesus died for us, but the Father, ah. But here's the thing the Father is so gracious. He's a, there's a song we sing. He's a good, good Father. He's, he's the Father you've been looking for. I'm not sure what kind of experience you had with a father, but it doesn't really matter if your dad was amazing or if your dad was a disaster because all of us, even those that had great dads, we're still going to need a heavenly father because if your dad was human, he couldn't possibly give you what you needed. Oh, if I'd have just had a better dad. No, that wouldn't have probably helped much. You're still broken. I'm still broken. You still need the father. You still need God. And so, what's God like? There's a passage in Psalm 103 that might just clarify your vision of who God is. He revealed his character to Moses and his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord, the Father, is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry, and filled with unfailing love. He will not constantly accuse us nor remain angry forever. 
He does not punish us for all our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. For his unfailing love toward those who fear him is as great as the height of the heaven above the earth. This is the loving kindness, the kessed love of God. And when we see what God is really like, we see his heart and it gives us courage and it gets us off the floor. So there he was, sobbing uncontrollably, clutching a basketball. Finally, Michael Jordan got up on his feet, composed himself, and the reporters had to try to frame a question, but they already had the answer. Their questions were, Michael, what's it like to have everything? Michael Jordan, what's it like to be the greatest player in the history of the sport? Michael, what's it like to have all the wealth and all the things in the world? You have an incredible life. How do you feel today? But the questions kind of fell flat because they could see that what Michael Jordan really wanted was not wealth and fame. What Michael Jordan really wanted was a father in his life. How about you? Would you like the father in your life? to say to you, I love you, I see you, I understand what you did there, I'm with you, you're not alone. If you wanna know the Father, you gotta come through the Son because Jesus came to reveal who the Father is. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord, I thank you for this time together with my precious brothers and sisters, this precious community of people and Lord, I know watching online and here in the room, there's people that have a lot of different stories and a lot of things going on in their life, but Lord, there's not one person that doesn't need the Father. And so we come in the vulnerability of that need, the raw lack that every one of us carries in our hearts. And we praise you that you came to fill that void to be our Father in heaven. And Jesus, you came to reveal who the Father was. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Father God, for sending your Son to die on a cross for us. Thank you for loving us so much. And thank you for healing our orphan hearts. Thank you for pouring out your Spirit upon our orphan culture and redeeming this orphan planet. I pray the love of God would be so strong and clear and so crisp and focused in every one of our lives that we would surrender immediately to it. And we would say, Jesus, I've come to follow you. Open our eyes and show us the Father. Just before we open our eyes and conclude the service, just while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I'm just wondering, maybe watching online or here in the room, there's somebody and you say, man, that, that, that prodigal son, that's me. I have so wasted my life. I'm so far from God. I believed every lie about the Father and I'm away from God, but today I need I need a relationship with God. I need to come home. I need to surrender and return to God. Maybe, maybe you are away from him because you've never known him or maybe you've known him in times past, but you've drifted, something happened and now you're away from God. But today's your chance to say, man, I'm coming back to God. I want a relationship with my father in heaven. If that's you, heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Just lift your hand. I wanna pray for you. And, I would never embarrass you. I'm not gonna ask you to stand. I'm not gonna ask you to identify yourself. Just between me and you, I wanna know who needs God. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. Just lift it up. I can see you. I see your hand. I'm coming to God. I see you in the back. I'm coming to God through Christ. Now everybody just look up at me. It's about a half dozen hands, maybe others watching online. Some that didn't raise their hand, but they said, man, I'm, that's me. We're gonna say a prayer together. 
We're going to turn our lives over to him. It's really simple. Whoever comes to God, he will in no wise cast out. So we don't have to make a big formal petition about this. We just say, Lord, I need you. I'm coming to you. And we're going to do that in prayer. So can we say a prayer together out loud? Just say these words after me. Father God, in Jesus' name, I humble myself and surrender to your love. Forgive my sins. Give me a new life. I believe in you and your love. And I surrender to it. In Jesus' name, amen.